And as you are, let me invite you to turn with me uh, to the book in the New Testament known as the book of Romans, uh, the 14th chapter, where we're going to be camping out for a little bit this morning in the last of our series uh, called City on a Hill. Uh, we're going to be uh, kicking off a new series next, next week called Connect, looking at the, one of our four kin, kind of key strategic elements, the way we can connect together here, connect with those outside, and then we'll, that'll segue right into our missions conference in a beautiful way. So we're going to finish up our series uh, looking at how we, like the early church, uh, form and nurture our life together as a community of faith in such a way as to sort of be distinctive from the culture around us, namely in the way that we treat each other, in the way that we respond to each other, in the way that we create space for one another in this diverse thing we call the body of Christ. So we're not new at this. The church has been wrestling and grappling with this for its entire existence, and we get a little snapshot into some of the issues that they were dealing with in this particular congregation in Rome in its earliest days. And so Paul writes to them these words of counsel and advice. He says, therefore... Let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but if it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, you destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It's not good to eat meat or drink or wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep that between yourself and God. And blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. And that's where we're going to pause this morning. All of this, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Lord, uh, the, the reality of human beings coming together in a community by, by intention and by design is fraught with our human frailty. And we all bring ourselves to this community, our, our messed up, broken, misordered selves, Lord. And sometimes we can get off track individually and corporately. And our desire, Lord, is to walk in the wisdom, in the counsel, in the way of your Holy Spirit. And so form a life together as a community of faith that we might stand as a bright, shining beacon of hope and life in this world. That we would be that city on a hill to which people are drawn, not to us, but to you, Lord. So would you, by your Spirit take these words of Paul and these very finite, fallible thoughts of mine and transform them miraculously by the power of your Holy Spirit so that they become, in this moment, words of life for us. Because we ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was many years ago, and uh, there were a group of guys coming over to my house for a barbecue. And so Nancy and I had done a lot of work to kind of prep for, you know, when you have people over, right, you get, you get ready, at least you hope you do, right? And so we had prepared lots of food and snacks and so forth. The hamburger patties were made. We were going to fire up the grill in a little bit, have the chips and snacks and stuff all ready to go. And as I was getting ready for this moment, this event, I was outside on the back porch and I was uh, filling the cooler full of drinks because we were just going to have the cooler out kind of on the back porch and people could kind of pick and choose whatever they wanted to. And as I was filling this cooler, I I had a moment. I had a moment of of just wondering what I should do. This was a mixed group of guys that were coming over. Some were part of the young kind of fledgling church that Nancy and I were involved in trying to help get started. And they were already people of faith, people who had committed their life to following Jesus. Others were not. Others were guys that that were friends of some of the guys that were part of our young church. And others were just guys that we had met somewhere along the way and enjoyed for some reason hanging out with us. 
And so they were coming to this barbecue because we had invited them. And as I was filling this cooler, realizing that this group was going to be a quite diverse mixed group, I, I, I just had a moment of, of pause. Should I only fill the cooler full of soft drinks and non-alcoholic beverages? Or should I throw a few beers in there to have with our barbecue? And honestly, I wasn't sure because I was, I, was, I was concerned. I was not sure, like, what would the, the guys who were already Christians think if they were at a barbecue at the pastor's house and there was beer at the barbecue? What would the non-Christian guys think if they went to a barbecue at somebody's house and there wasn't beer with the barbecue? Would, there be, would that be weird? Would we be weird as, as, as a result of that? And so I, I, I sort of, as I was going through this process, sort of grappled and prayerfully thought, well, I don't, you know, I don't, there is no exact, precise, right answer to this. And so I, I thought, well, I, I think probably the best thing to do is put in a little bit of each and then leave it up to the individual to decide what, whatever their conscience lets them uh, feel comfortable with and not make it a matter of have to, but let people decide on their own. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Apparently, it became a very big deal, but not necessarily in the way that you would think. The guys who were there who were already committed Christians and followers of Christ actually didn't think anything of it. My non-Christian friends who came to hang out in our backyard, apparently for them, it made a profound impression. In fact, one of the guys who came, who was not yet a committed follower of Christ, told me months later, after he had given his life to Christ, that that moment was a transformative moment in his life. When he realized he could be around a group of Christians and enjoy a beer with his burger and not feel judged about it. In fact, he found it quite liberating that his pastor was enjoying a beer with his burger. And that very act somehow gave him the permission, the freedom to continue searching, to continue seeking. Because he saw something in that moment, something that I was not sure about and felt a little bit of disquiet in my spirit, but trusting that the Lord would, would, would guide in that moment he found in that a beautiful, winsome, attractive community that he wanted to become a part of. He later, he and his wife later uh, came on our, Nancy and I led a marriage course. And he made very clear at, the, at that point, they were just there for the marriage, none of the religious stuff, just there for the, to, to work on their marriage. After he came to faith, the next thing I knew, he was back working on our AV team, his wife was helping out. I mean, they were, just got super involved and that involvement started, the door to faith opened because he came into contact with a community of faith in which there was a degree of freedom and room to grow, no matter where you were on your journey. And that's, that was his experience. I, I, I didn't realize at the moment that it was that big of a deal. But I was keenly aware in that moment as I was filling that cooler that while I had freedom of conscience about non-essentials in Scripture, that was my right, I also had an even greater sense of responsibility. A greater sense of responsibility to do what I could to ensure that the light of Christ would shine brightly through my life and through the community that we were seeking to nurture and care for. So often we talk in this day and age about our rights. But in the body of Christ, it's more about our responsibility to each other and to the welfare and the well-being of our community, and making sure that she is healthy and flourishing and that the light of Christ shines brightly through her. That's exactly what Paul was concerned about in dealing with his friends in the church in Rome, as he writes this to him. When you read the whole chapter of chapter 14, you see this issue was quite uh, vexing for them. Uh, there were a couple of different groups of people in this church who had disagreements 
about what was and what was not permissible to eat or drink. And they were fussing at each other. And he divides them into two camps. One he calls the, the strong, the other he calls the weak. And we automatically tend to think of the weak group as what? Weak, right? But, but in fact, that, that English word is not a good sort of rendering of what he's grappling with. When he uses the words strong and weak, he's not using them in a pejorative or derogatory sense. He's using them to describe people's consciences, their spirits. And the group that he, he calls the weak, those, that is, those people have a conscience that's more sensitive. It's more easily disquieted, more easily disrupted. And so, as, as a means of, of keeping some balance to their faith life, they need to make more conservative and more restrictive decisions about their lifestyle choices. He says, those are, those are the folks, it's a, it's a poor, in English anyway, it's a poor choice of words to describe them as weak, but he's, I think a, a better English description would be they're, they're a more sensitive group. And then he says there's another group. They're, these are the folks that, that he calls strong. They're the ones whose conscience allows them to have a greater measure of freedom without it compromising or damaging their faith. And they were kind of at odds with each other about what was and what was not permissible for those who follow Jesus. And they started fussing at each other. And so Paul is writing to them to try to help them understand how to live together as this diverse body with different points of view and different perspectives and different sensitivities with their conscience, how to live together as a unified body together in spite of all of that. He doesn't necessarily, interestingly enough, elevate one group above. He doesn't say the strong or the better group. In fact, I think he would probably put himself in that camp because he seems, as you read his letters, he seems himself to enjoy a greater measure of freedom. He doesn't necessarily put himself in that camp. What he does want to convey, however, is this. When we come together as a community of faith, as a people seeking to live into our identity as a city on a hill, we are less concerned with asserting our rights than we are maintaining and lifting up the responsibility that we have to one another. Nobody's going to say amen to that, because that's the central point of what he's driving home. And I realize that that is countercultural. I'll say more about that later. We can all too often denigrate and disparage and even judge someone else within the community who has a different point of view than we do. Because what tends to happen is we want people to live out their faith in the way that we are most comfortable. And we think everybody else should live that way. Amen? Come on, be honest, right? Don't we all do that? We all do that, right? We, we, we think, well, this is the way you should live out your faith. This is the proper way. And so everybody should live that way. Precisely the way I do. Because that's the way you do it, right? Well, not according to Paul. He gives, he gives within the body of Christ a certain, a certain measure of latitude. It's not anything goes, but there's a certain measure of latitude to give folks room to grow. But we're not so good at that, generally speaking. My way is the right way, right? And we've been fussing up at each other ever since. This isn't new. I mean, I think, think about the different factions and groups that have arisen and fussed at each other and sometimes gotten downright nasty with one another and, and, and broken fellowship with one another. Like some of my fundamentalist friends, you, know, you can't go to movies, you can't play cards, you can't go to dances, right? Or as they used to say, you don't drink, don't chew, and don't go with girls who do. <laughs> <laughs> Used to have some uh, friends growing up who were who were from the, the, the Baptist stream of, of the thing, and they would they would become quite passionate about the form of baptism, and and and, and, and sort of elevating what I believe in Scripture is a non-essential to the status of an essential, and we would go to the mat over you have to be baptized by immersion or it's not legitimate. Or as my friend used to tell me, if you ain't been dipped, you've been gypped. 
And we would, we would kind of get go at it about whether or not one had to be baptized by immersion in order for that to be va a valid form of uh, an experience of baptism. Or my charismatic friends would say sometimes, well, if you, if, you, if you claim to have the Holy Spirit, but you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You haven't been filled with the Spirit. You haven't been anointed with the Spirit. Somebody say glory. <laughs> right? And, and, and we sort of set up these, these camps. Yeah, you're, you're a, you're a top-tier Christian, and you're somewhere down on the second or third tier, right? Or my Catholic friends would say, well, if you don't believe, David, that the, the, the bread and the cup are the actual body and blood of Jesus, then you are not part of the true church. And so it goes. It, 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 within this, this family, we have these family feuds. And we fuss at each other, and we disagree, and sometimes we separate, and sometimes we cause harm to one another as a consequence of those differing points of view and divergences. And this is not new. <laughs> we, we've, we've fought with each other. In some seasons in the history of the church, we've actually killed people over these issues. Non-essentials to the faith. I love the way author David Guzik describes this situation here in the Roman church. Listen to what he says. He says, undoubtedly, these weak ones did not see themselves as weaker. It's likely they thought they were the stronger ones and the meat eaters were the weak ones. Legalism has a way of making us think that we are strong and those who don't keep the rules the way that we do are weak. And the strict Christian found it easy to judge his brother, writing him off as unspiritual meat eater compromiser. The free Christian found it easy to show contempt against his brother, regarding him as an uptight, legalistic goody-good. And essentially, Paul's answer is, stop worrying about your brother. You have enough to answer to before Jesus. There's a lot of truth in that. Instead of giving each other room to grow, we try to force each other into the mold that we are most comfortable in. But here's the thing. Unity is not the same thing as uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. We are different. We come at this life of faith from different experiences, backgrounds, perspectives. Unity is about a person, namely Jesus, and his purpose for us, namely to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded them, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and his passion for our lives. That is what gives us our unifying center. Amen? Amen? We don't all have to be exactly the same or even see things exactly the same. Again, it's not anything goes. There are certain parameters and boundaries, but within those boundaries, there's a lot of freedom and discretion for how we live out our faith together but we keep <laughs> trying <laughs> to force people. Even Jesus found this was the case with his own disciples. In Mark chapter 9, verse 38, John comes to him, John the disciple, and says, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. <laughs> but Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Like, let them go. Even though they're not doing it exactly the way that you do it, the way that we do it together as a group, that's okay. They're not against us, so they're for us. Let them preach. Let them heal. Let them promote the, the good news of God's love. The early church grappled with this a lot, not just the church in Rome, but the earliest days of the church, you see it, you get a window into this in the 15th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, where there, there's a, a dispute among the Jewish leaders of the early church and this new kind of upstart group made up of Gentiles, non-Jews. And the Jews were the ones, they were the trailblazers. They were the initial kind of formation of what we now call the church. And they wondered out loud and kind of fussed at each other about whether or not someone could be a come, become a follower of Jesus without first becoming Jewish. Was there an intermediary step that needed to take place before one could give their life to becoming a follower of Jesus? And the disagreement got so intense, they had to call a meeting, 
a committee, a big committee meeting. And they called what's known as the Council of Jerusalem. It's one of the first kind of corporate decision-making moments in the life of the early church. And thankfully, by the grace of God, they decided to give these Gentiles room to grow and some space to be their own people and their own culture and follow Jesus in their own way. There were some restrictions, but not many. They said, we, we purpose not to place too heavy a burden upon them. And they only, there were only a couple things they asked them to pay attention to. And thankfully, they didn't require them first to become Jews. Can you imagine? How many of us would be sitting here this morning if we had to jump through that additional hoop in order to give our lives to follow Christ as Lord and Savior? In the earliest days of the church, they're still grappling with this. And we are, even today, a couple thousand years later, and that's just the nature of our brokenness. We've been dealing with it ever since. I love the story Nicky Gumbel tells on the Alpha Course uh, about this very issue. He says this, he said, I heard about a man who was standing in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge, admiring the view, when another tourist walked up alongside of him to do the same. And I heard him say quietly, as he took in the beauty of the view, what an awesome God. I turned to him and said, oh, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I am a Christian. I said, so am I, and we shook hands. I said, are you a liberal or a fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a fundamental Christian. I said, so am I, and we smiled and nodded to each other. I said, are you a covenant or a dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I, and we slapped each other on the back. I said, are you an early acts, mid acts, late acts, dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a mid acts, dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I, and we agreed to exchange Christmas cards the next year. I said, are you an Acts 9 or Acts 13 mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm an Acts 9 um, and a mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian. He said, so am I, and we hugged each other right there on the bridge. I said, are you a pre-trib or post-trib Acts 9 mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a pre-trib Acts 9 mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I, and we agreed to exchange our kids for the summer. I said, are you a 12 in or 12 out pre-trib Acts 9 mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a 12 in pre-trib Acts 9 mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, you heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> it, it, we laugh, but it's not that far from the truth, from the way that we kind of pigeonhole each other and size each other up and, and try to to make sure that you are conforming to the way that I think you should live out your faith in following Jesus. But that's not what the scripture teaches. Paul sketches out a healthier way. I love what he says. This is the pivotal verse in this text. Verse 19. Look at it again. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Let's make Jesus and following him our focal point in the life together that we're forming as a community of faith in a city on a hill. Let's look for common ground together. Let's find ways guided by love for one another and greater concern for our responsibilities than our rights to build each other up, to encourage each other. And for goodness sake, Let's cut each other some slack. Just give each other some room to grow. We're all a work in progress. None of us has it all figured out. None of us has a corner on the market of truth. None of us has arrived. We're all a work in progress. If there's a point of contention that you have with someone, work for peace. Work for understanding. Paul says elsewhere, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Jesus himself said this in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the, what? Peacemakers, for they shall be called daughters and sons of the living God. I wonder if John and his friends were listening in at that moment. John, the one who wanted to kind of kick out the other people because they weren't part of their group. What a refreshingly different 
and distinctive and, dare I say, countercultural way to live in a society in which what we prize most are our rights. But in the body of Christ, in this community, we don't so much as assert our rights as embrace our responsibility to each other. And that is a radically different way to live. We have in this country a bill of rights. Maybe our founders should have printed a companion document called the Bill of Responsibilities, too. I wonder what we'd be like as a nation if that were the case. But that's the truth of what it looks like when we live together as a city on a hill. It's not so much about me and what I want and my point of view trumping or or triumphing over yours, but how can we together mutually edify and build each other up as we seek to follow Christ, his purpose, his passion for our life together, especially in these moments that Mark alluded to in his prayer that are so divisive and so polarizing and one group pitting itself against another and tearing each other down, there ought to be a spirit in the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit, by which we keep our hearts and our minds fixed on Jesus. We love each other. We give each other room to grow. Amen? Amen. None of us is perfect, and none of us has this figured out. As we commit to the way of love and to love each other, Paul says this, verse 22, the faith that you have, Keep it between yourself and God. Don't try to force other people into your mold. And blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. If we live this way, maybe, just maybe, we'll meet more people like my buddy who came to my barbecue and who will see and experience amongst us a beautifully winsome, different way of life. Life in the city on the hill. May God make it so. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace in our lives. Um, None of us, myself included, have everything figured out or dialed in just perfectly. We all fall short. We all make mistakes. Most of us, most days, are doing the best we can. But we all fall short, Lord, and thank you that your mercy and your grace are abundant for us. I pray, God, that you would help us in our life together, in our love and relationships with each other, to to emulate that sense of graciousness that you show to us. Help us to give each other grace, room to grow, and seek peace and mutual building up together. Because when we live that way, we fulfill the desire of Jesus' heart when he prayed in John 17 that we would be one just as you and he were, are one. But that can't happen in our brokenness, Lord. We need you. We need your help. We need your grace. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to live that way, Lord. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come and move among us. Minister to us and through us and help us genuinely to love and care for each other. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen and amen.